So welcome everybody. Um, I'm just going to fly through these slides very quickly um, regarding Kickstart and Community Heat. Community Heat was a program that we developed through the Network Innovation Allowance um, program with um, UK Power Network. So it's a DNO funded project from the Electricity Networks where we investigated how a rural village could come off oil for heating and transition to electric heating and um, and electric vehicles. And it's provided a model that some other community energy groups have, have taken up and we've developed kind of a, a quicker kickstart approach to this in engagement. Really, it's about engaging the rural communities. So, um, and we offered the kickstart to a few um, community energy groups to test out in local parishes. Um, and one in particular up at, with Sacrum Warden Community Energy in Essex. Um, it, it basically provided a community energy plan for a rural village to transition. And I'll, I'll come to the point in a minute. But that, that included the carbon and energy, energy use of the village, how the properties are heated within the parish, um, the review of housing archetypes, review of heat and energy suppliers locally so that the community can connect with local supply chain, explore um, community transport and EVs, and also measure the interest within the community for community energy and local schemes. And um, because UK Power Networks, the DNO was involved, we have, we have a clear indication of the capacity within the community of the, the electricity network. So where the capacity is within the local LV network. Which is really interesting. Um, so just a little bit, just to align with the challenge and the community that I'm targeting on here in, in Barkham and down in Sussex. Um, the, there was the clean growth strategy um, committed to phasing out fossil fuels by the end of the decade for existing homes. So th that was an important factor. Um, and also the household had, the, the grid was constrained locally and we have a high use of oil use within this estimate, this village. And the village wanted to transition to electric vehicles as well. So within the area, 45% growth by, 25, by 2025 was estimated. And most importantly, in my view, the council were committed to a very robust net zero target by 2030. So all these factors play into that. Um, there's a little bit of information about the target community we did. Um, so heating and power make up 30% of the carbon emissions for this village that we looked at. 78% um, use oil for burning, um, for making heat, um, and so double the national footprint, which is quite difficult for rural communities. Um, and this one, in total, there were 703 homes, um, and we broke up the different housing archetypes within the village. So, you know, pre-1800s, um, 1950s homes. So that, and you can, you can see how these different archetypes could retrofit and lead to a retrofit market. Um, the actual roadmap that we built at the end of the program with Borough Happold supporting so an engineering firm um, gave us some really interesting indications. Most importantly, that a planned approach to renewables could provide 75% saving on network reinforcement. So a planned approach to network reinforcement. Um, but also we started to map around the village 17 renewable sites, small scale renewable sites, you know, um, around 200, 250 kilowatt sites, standalone sites that could be located around the village and in future play perfectly with the energy local model and other models like that. So it basically provided a detailed plan for this community to decarbonize. Now, um, this, is a, this is my key sort of thought around community energy, where you've got a community energy group that, in this case, I've made it up, it's in central Bedfordshire, but where Shepherd is the community energy group to the market town, to grow the outreach for that community energy group, these parishes could do 
the kickstart community program. So you could do the decarbonisation plan for multiple parishes because the common denominator is the market town. So where the parishes use the market town. So in this way, it grows the, the business or the action plan and your option to the community energy group to expand into the parishes. And in doing so, give the parishes their own decarbonisation tax. And um, both Avesco and Saffron Warden Community Energy have done that. And I'll give you some links at the end of this short presentation. Um, so the, yeah, the, the links are there. Um, sorry, with reference, I've put the two links there um, to the Avesco and Saffron Warden Community Energy plans. Um, where this is important is that community builds a local marketplace, not only for retrofit, but also for community energy. And that includes benefits for the supply chain, being able to inform the supply chain of working locally, connecting people so we can get a trusted local service, um, which is what community energy is so good at with local energy champions and energy advice. But also it provides a map for, for detailed options for local community energy. So thank you very much. We'll we'll catch up in the in the breakout room. And I think I'm passing on to John. Yes, thank you. You have got some questions there in the uh, chat box. But yes, can we hand over to John now, please? Who's going to speak about um, rooftop solar? Uh, yep, yeah, uh, just about to share screen as well. Um, bear with me. Uh, need to try and get rid of all the other bits around. Okay, so uh, my name is John Rawlings. I'm a director at Renew EV. Uh, we are a small uh, engineering consultancy business. Um, and uh, we believe that the community energy is key to the transition uh, to net zero. Um, so whilst it's not everything that we do, uh, we have a division which uh, supports asset development for community energy companies. Um, we, um, uh, so we do asset development for community energy groups, uh, but we do also do general renewable energy consultancy uh, and landowner representation. Uh, but the focus is very much going to be on uh, the community energy side. Uh, we work with a variety uh, of community energy groups. Uh, we're a bit different and we, we, we kind of back things up in that we're also, we also have minor, minority shareholders uh, of community energy groups so that it's kind of hardwired into our shareholder agreement. Um, but I really want to focus on uh, the rooftop uh, development that's been going on and how the game has changed uh, in the last six months uh, and why it's never been a better time to move into uh, rooftop. Um, so success to date. So, you know, it is very much real. Uh, what happens? So we've installed uh, in the last 12 months nearly or just over uh, a megawatt. Uh, this is Beach and Cliff School in Bath, which is a 262 uh, kilowatt installation. Um, we've got more than uh, two megawatts in the pipeline uh, and, and just over 250 kilowatts uh, being scheduled at the moment, um, which is really exciting. I think there'd been a bit of a, a bit of a hiatus uh, in rooftop solar uh, after the uh, removal of the feed-in tariff. Uh, but the market is now quite different, uh, and it means that uh, whilst the opportunity is there, it's there very much there for us to take it. So what are those shifts? Um, so what's making things better? Um, so actually the high retail rates at the moment um, are making things uh, better for solar. Uh, people are looking for ways to take back control, to, to recoin a phrase, um, and kind of hedge against uh, the, um, the market at the moment. There is definitely a greater sense of an awareness um, of climate change uh, and everything that's happening. Uh, and people want to get a sense of agency because it's very difficult to know what they can do. Uh, general inflation uh, and, and cost of living crisis um, is obviously a problem. And you know, the likes of schools who are facing you know, six figure increases uh, in their energy bills, they're making some very difficult choices around you know, paying their electricity bill and how many teachers they can have. Um, so things like that that we can we can help with, um, but also the export rates. Export rates have never been higher. Um, uh, we've reached a high high water mark. I think we've managed to or we're aware of uh, an export rate of thirty three pence per kilowatt hour, uh, which is completely bonkers. Um, previously, you would 
uh, size and installation for on-site consumption. So you'd have a situation where you'd, you wish you could fill the roof, uh, but you wouldn't because the on-site consumption was there. Um, for those who are willing to take a risk um, uh, over the next sort of three to five years uh, and believe export rates will remain high, uh, you can pay back an installation very quickly uh, with export rates at these sort of um, uh, figures, uh, which means that your, your portfolio opens up to uh, a slightly more uh, diverse range of sites that you can go after. Uh, rather than just selling on site. However, um, supply chain is challenging, um, labor is challenging and scaffolding uh, is uh, expensive. So uh, there are some counter counterbalances to it, but broadly um, it is a very exciting place to be in at the moment. Uh, lots going on uh, and not just sort of conversations, but a lot of delivery. Um, so if you want to know more about it, um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions in the breakout rooms. Thank you very oh, much. I, f I, f I forgot this slide. <laughs> I forgot this slide. Oh, quick. Just, one, just one more on this slide. So um, uh, the, when approaching it, the three C's, uh, cost, capability and consent. Um, uh, so cost, um, uh, in, in, the, in the proposal, we have to keep the site in mind. Uh, it will always be cheaper uh, buying, um, than buying from the grid. Um, so what we've do, we do now is we have uh, a tracker. So you're always a percentage below the grid. Uh, which gives the sites confidence uh, that they're not going to end up paying more from the uh, more for the solar on on the electricity on their roof than from the grid. Um, a capped price uh, is also very very um, welcome. Um, there is no need uh, for us to profiteer from the geopolitical uh, position at the moment. Um, so a cap, which delivers, still delivers a very good return, um, is is very welcome, uh, and the effective discount therefore increases. Uh, and contribution to legal fees for the sites. You know, if it is a, uh, a, a site that's a, a community building, say a school, uh, we wouldn't want them to be out of pocket uh, in year one. So contributing to legal fees uh, can remove all of those barriers uh, to keep it, um, keep it easy. Um, in terms of what's being brought, it's the capability. Um, so the supply chain experience, it, lots of people want to do solar, but don't necessarily know how or why or what kind of saving it would be. Um, so by removing that problem from them, um, they, they take a lot of confidence from that uh, and the continuity of care. So um, you know, it would be uh, dangerous to install uh, solar installation and just leave it there for 25 years. Um, having it monitored, looked after, um, you know, reviewed uh, it is, is welcome as well uh, so that they know it's going to be safe throughout the duration of the lease. And then the final bit is consent. Um, so for rooftop solar, uh, it's typically de uh, permitted development, um, but in some settings, uh, it can be more challenging, uh, listed buildings and things like that. We certainly find that uh, uh, community groups uh, have a bit of a sway when it comes to planning. Um, so it means that you can potentially get um, installations away where you wouldn't otherwise have got them. Um, so they're the three C's. I uh, will stop there. So if you're interested, please come and ask me more in the breakout. Thank you, John. Um... And now whizzing through all of these, there are lots of questions actually in the chat box. There. I think you were trying to address some of them, but do feel free to answer more. I, I ignored it completely. It put me off my stride. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll, well, I'll go into it now and see if I can answer in the chat box. <laughs> um, Now, can I pass over to Michael Bevan, please, who's going to talk about public sector decarbonisation. Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, use my presentation at the moment because just I'll, I'll talk through the principles of it but very briefly um basically i'm i'm from our community enterprise we're a, um, a consultancy and i've been working with community energy south in essex and we worked with tolls per climate partnership which is a new new community energy group um and they particularly wanted to look at um the decarbonizing their school um we looked at the actual the maths of it basically and the business case did not work using community investment it just the the cost of decarbonizing was far too great so what we looked at was then said okay where is where is the potential funding for this um and there is what's known as the public sector decarbonization scheme um short you always abbreviated a psds um basically that funds the, dec the decarbonization of fossil fuel systems um where 
um, which are at the end of the life with low carbon alternatives. Um, but it involves fabric first, so basically a site would look at be look at having um, insulation in improvements, look at energy saving, energy generation, so solar PV and such like. But the key principle is uh, the 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 site has to have a fossil fuel system which is end of life. Tolsbury School um, is a primary school with oil boilers, um, and basically it fitted the criteria. But the two, but the re, the real it, one of the real problems for this is basically um, PSDS also requires match funding of at least twelve percent, and they also put a cap on the amount of funding they'll put depending on the amount of carbon saved, um, and and basically because of that it wasn't a priority for the local authority to invest in because they had other they the other other sites more were higher priority, but tolls became a client partnership the TCP, they were, talked to the school and basically agreed that they would actually look at a joint bid uh, where the school would bid and to, and tolls per client partnership would actually effectively raise community investment to make the to make it possible. We we're not there yet. Um, had a meeting last week with Salix who are the managing the who are managing the program and basically expecting to get a grant fund a grant letter probably in the next week or two. And what that will do is it will enable a £600,000 project to go ahead with about £400,000 of grant investment from the PSDS and £200,000 investment from the local community. That investment for the local community will be repaid by the, by the school, by this part of the savings from the energy use on the school. So the school will cut its carbon emissions and its energy use by approximately two, well, I think it's it's two thirds in a year, and then almost, and then down to about 10% um, within, within a couple of years. Um, and that is all enabled by that local investment. Um, and we, the, the, T, the, the TCP will be going out to raise funding probably in March, April, um, potentially with um, tax relief for investors. Um, and if this works, I think it'll be the first, first situation in the country where um, government grant has been combined with community investment and it will be a model that can be taken out anywhere or any other, any other public building. Um, that's, that's a principle. Um, I have a presentation which I'm happy to share with people, um, which gives a bit more detail and again, happy to join and talk more about the workshops. Thank you, Michael. That was really impress interesting and impressive. Um, Carl, could you uh, get ready? Could you set yourself up? Um, there are some questions for you in the chat box there, Michael, um, but it may be people will join you in your breakout room or perhaps you could respond in the chat box. Um, and uh, welcome to Carl. Good morning, everybody, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me uh, here to talk. It's, it's it true. It has been fascinating. Some really interesting uh, uh, ideas and sort of new, new sort of business, which I never ne never come across. So um, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm I'm from Abundance. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, we're a, a, a regulated investment platform that are focused on enabling um, the public to uh, invest and finance the building of of low carbon net zero infrastructure. Um, we've we've raised about 150 million to date, um, and we allow sort of anybody to invest from as little as as, as five pounds into these projects and use things such as ISAs and and pension wrappers to, um, to to make those investments. Um, uh, the bit that I was asked to talk about today is, 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 is a new area that we're focused on, uh, which is municipal finance, where we raise money for local authorities. Um, and I think the piece that's relevant here is, you know, local authorities represent, you know, an interesting partner for the community energy space. Um, they often have assets that need uh, uh, sort of you know, decarbonizing or can have generation technologies put on. Um, they often lack uh, the, the resources internally to develop projects, um, uh, but they have, on the other hand, uh, you know, in, in, in very uh, good borrowing powers and access to cheap money, um, which 
uh, potentially opens up a, a, a partnership for community energy groups who want to work with a, a local authority to uh, decarbonize assets um, uh, in their community. So um, maybe just sort of elaborating on that a, a little bit more and, and we can sort of dig into the detail there from our experience working with different councils on, on how community entry groups could work with and, and partner with councils. But um, you know, in, in, in theory, councils can raise money and, and lend that money to community energy groups delivering projects. Um, they obviously also can just uh, open up their assets for community energy groups to, to do work on and, uh, and then the community energy group is, is left to raise the capital that they need to deliver those projects. Um, and there's obviously many different flavors of, of partnership that, that happen between those two. Um, the bit that I just wanted to, to talk to is um, a way that we raise money from the community to be invested in the council. And then the council can use that money to uh, potentially invest into community energy groups um, or to fund projects that the community energy group might be working with the council to deliver, um, but re maybe remain in the ownership of, of the council. Um, so uh, traditionally councils borrow from a from a, a body called the Public Works Loan Board. Um, and what we've essentially created working with the six councils on the side is a way that citizens can um, lend money as an alternative to the council going to the PWRB. And, and, the, and the key point here is what we're sort of proving is that citizens are, are happy to lend money to a council at a rate which is cheaper than the Public Works Loan Board. Um, because they still get a rate which is attractive in comparison to the rates they might get on their savings accounts or, 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 or other low risk investments. Um, from a council's perspective, the money that is raised from residents is, is treated identically to the money that they would borrow from any other source. Um, and, uh, and, and using crowdfunding, the process for the council is, is very efficient because the crowdfunding platform administers the investors. Well, the, I'm getting a bit of an echo back on me, but hopefully um, that's uh, clear. Um, so, so essentially, um, yeah, the the, the council ha has a way of, of of connecting with residents, building them into the process of of decarbonising the region. Um, and what we're also seeing is because of the risk profile of lending money to a council, which is which is very low. Um, no council has, has in the UK has ever defaulted on its its debts. Um, people are also happy to donate their interest back to the council to uh, help with further decarbonisation. So as an example, with uh, West Berkshire Council, which was the first council to, to use this mechanism, they raise money uh, not for a community energy project per se, but to do projects uh, in their, in, 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 that they were uh, owning and controlling. Um, it ranged from some rooftop solar, uh, energy efficiency, cycleway improvement, um, so citizens in West Berkshire lent West Berkshire money uh, at a rate that undercut the uh, traditional borrowing rate of the council. And then those same citizens donated uh, on average been about 10% of their interest back to the council. And that money is being used for sort of very specific sort of natural capital projects such as rewilding and, and tree planting. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that hopefully just gives a bit of a flavour. Um, and I think the bit that in the breakout session I'd like to just sort of explore with people is is, is how um, you know, community energy can can partner uh, with with councils and, and in theory the the municipal investment structure we've created uh, help that process. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, that all sounds very encouraging. Um, I could say more, but I won't because we've now um, I've just launched the breakout rooms. So I hope you can all see your see them all. Um, we practiced this yesterday, so you should be able to assign yourself and go into the breakout room, which looks the most appealing to you. Um, and you will have um, half an hour or just under half an hour. You have to 20 past 11 in the breakout rooms and then we'll report back and I will ask the chair of each breakout room to report back, um, just give us a little summary of what's happened in your breakout room. Do. So can I invite Esme to uh, report back from the energy local room? If she's yeah, here. Of, of course. So um, obviously energy local is an in-depth model, so we could only really touch on some of the key themes. Um, so Amy gave us a, a slightly more detailed presentation, um, which was um, 
very interesting. So perhaps Amy can distribute that throughout the group. And then we had a, a few question and answers about how Energy Local works. So um, there was a few things that were, were asked. Um, we were looking at generators. So at the moment, Energy Local, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, um, you, you want a single generator, um, a fairly large generator if possible. Uh, and you went, you, you get a PPA in place. And one thing that is limited, um, one project is that their PPA was only for, uh, with the generator was only for one year. And of course, community energy relies on a longer PPA than that. Um, so if you're going to existing generators, they may not give you a longer PPA. Um, so that, that we went into that in quite a lot of detail um, and then looked at some of the other ways of applying the model. So um, I think it's best that everybody has a look at Amy's uh, presentation and that more Q&A afterwards. What's the best way to Have share it. that? Um, well, if you send it to me, I'll send it right. out. To okay, no problem. I just say that um, you can have more than one generator, but it's with Green Energy UK. With an Oxford Club, it's one generator only. There you go. I'm learning. <laughs> and the length of the PPA is down to the generator and the supplier. That's the generator. So we want community energy projects to push that length of the PPA mm. a bit uh, further, really, so that we can do our financial modelling. OK, thank you. Well, I hope it's been helpful for people, even if it's been a whistle stop tour and perhaps we need to organise another one where we go even where we have like the whole 90 minutes. I'm going to hand over to Nikki now, who's going to report back on the Kickstart project. And Nikki, you have two minutes. OK, I'm on Ollie's computer. I'm on Ollie's computer because we're kind of um, side by side. Um, so we had a, a good discussion or a little bit of um, technical problems. Um, but after we got over those, we had a discussion around, you know, how sometimes communities are apathetic um, and how to to move um, to move that apathy and to get to get people moving. Um, uh, we had some feedback about the report that um, Littlebury had put together near Saffron Walden from um, Stuart Bird from Sustainable Danbury, who said that he's hearing that report is, is really um, helpful for people. Um, we, we just talked about how to give information. We spoke with um, Spencer Talked, who is near Berry. Burry, Berry. Um, sorry, Spencer, I didn't get exactly where you were from. Um, and his his experience with his community, um, and also Anne's experience from Hayden Bridge. Um, and they're working with a company called Reheat, who I think are biomass people, um, to look at the whole um, the whole village and see see what they can do there. So we had a yeah, we had a good good discussion, uh, and we gave out our details if anyone wanted to contact us. Lovely, thank you, um, Nikki. Uh, Callum, are you able to report back from the rooftop solar room? Absolutely. Um, there's lots and lots of questions, um, and John fielded them very well. Um, we had an initial question around securing high export tariffs um, and how how this could magically be achieved, um, and that was through specifically through bright renewables but is more widely seen through the aggregation of PPAs, um, which is quite an interesting mechanism um, for kind of getting uh, um, export prices of around uh, 12 pence per kilowatt hour um, with no kind of uh, minimum volume needed, which is really attractive. Um, but then we had a question around if that applied to a portfolio of projects and a portfolio of generation technology, so not just solar, um, and yes, the answer to that is yes, that they do. Um, we're starting to see some movement in wind as policy kind of shifts back towards slowly onshore wind, um, but also kind of uh, accepting that um, in Renew EV's experience, hydro uh, still kind of uh, it, it remains quite a tricky um, technology to kind of uh, crack open. Um, we had a lot of discussion and, and conversation and, and questions on batteries, um, uh, specifically if they can be used to secure those higher export tariffs. Um, if on-site generation, for instance, isn't uh, 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 particularly large, um, uh, seem to be a case-by-case -case, um, uh, uh, 
scenario. Um, but day and night tariffs definitely were something that could make the financial um, happy cuts. Um, we also had um, uh, a discussion on solar on uh, being installed on carports, so specifically building carports and then having uh, solar panels and EV charging around that. And really interesting point around uh, what was considered maybe best practice from uh, an environmental point of view in that if we've got structures already in place, they should kind of be our first port of call to, to put solar onto. Then probably second to that should be paved areas where we want to, to, to build new structures because there's a carbon carbon cost in, in that building of structure. Um, and then kind of lastly, you want to look at green areas um, because we have precious few green areas left. <laughs> you know, they want to be our kind of last resort. And so tackle the, the things that we already have um, structures on. Um, and then uh, we touched on the carbon cost of manufacturing batteries, um, which Carbon Vault had put out like, kind of end-to-end -end life cycle, um, or sorry, end-to-end -end, uh, manufacturing point of view um, uh, output of one ton per kilowatt hour, which is quite high. Um, and when Renew EV have looked at the life cycle um, emissions for um, uh, carbon in terms of uh, how much you'll be saving around grid decarbonisation, it was looking at around 20 years at 250 grams per kilowatt hour, um, which most batteries are kind of rated for about 10 years. So there, there's a big question around if your desire for battery usage um, is carbon savings, is that what you're going to be meeting? If it's, uh, you know, if, if it's actually um, grid export that you're looking at or costs and tariffs, there are a lot of different points that you need to kind of consider when thinking about batteries um, and particularly around the battery technology you're looking at. So lithium ion um, and uh, your lead acids that not all of these uh, technologies are kind of created equally. Um, also not created equally, DNOs and grid connections and the difficulties around particular or name names, but um, in terms of uh, kind of working with different DNOs, um, it's it's a, a, a little bit of a, a wild card landscape. So I guess if you're in an area with um, an easy DNO, then well done. If not, then maybe work with another community energy group or a, or a hub to try and crack that nut open because um, that can still be uh, quite quite an issue. I think there were other things, but I think no, I think we're going to have to stop some, there because we've got to get two more reports back, and yeah. we, oh no, three more, and and everybody wants to go because it's half eleven. So what Nicola, marks are they taking? Yes, absolutely, Nicola. Can I hand over to you, please? And yes. just really quickly Thank back. Thank you. I um, accompanied Mike um, from First Thermal, who presented on the cheese project. Um, the retrofit costs of, of, of our homes on average are far too high for most people. So this does present a great opportunity for a first re retrofit. It helps start people on their journey, highlighting the easy and priority jobs, which is key. Um, community organisations... Um, are trusted, unlike commercial companies which are knocking on doors. So that's why, that's where there's a great fit for community energy to be driving this. And community energy groups have a key position in the transition to energy saving from that perspective. Now, we had a great question about whether um, this movement could influence new builds and influence college course provisions. And Mike has said it has been very hard so far. So community energy groups all around the country could influence that by getting on to their local providers and the local authorities. The other place where we think community energy groups could be really fundamental in pushing forward this type of action is for them to work with a social housing provider. Hasn't got to be a local authority, could be a separate one as well, because they community energy groups are really strong at the engagement, whereas the commercial aren't. And you've got trust. And the people who are living in those places might be very well positioned and might benefit from participating in the community energy group as volunteers. Um, that way you're going to reach more people who are vulnerable. Thank that, you. That wraps it up. Thank you, Nicola. Right, handing over to Laura. I'm sorry it's such a <laughs> whistle stop for everyone. Uh, Laura. Thanks, Liz. Um, we're in a group with Michael from um, our community enterprise on the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Um, and as we believe it's the first of its kind in the country, um, the presentation very much was focused on the toll, for example, that he mentioned. 
Um, we talked a bit more about the installation and the staged approach that that's going to take. They're starting a two-year rolling program, starting off with insulation and then ultimately installing, a, I think, 87 kilowatt heat pump. Um, the allowed to public sector decarbonisation funding is limited by the level of carbon savings that can be achieved. Um, we discussed the difference between sort of conventional community um, investment and, and this, and the difference seem, seems to be that um, in this example, the Tolsbury Community Partnership isn't actually owning an asset, it's just helping finance the school's installed assets, so there's no ownership there. Um, and the legal approach, uh, you know, as opposed to sort of a lease or a longer term lease that a conventional community energy project involves, this is a, a partner, a legal partnership between the school, um, Essex County Council and Tolsbury. Um, the sort of critical path to success initially were grants from Essex and Mould and Borough Councils to undertake the feasibility um, and a huge amount of volunteer time that have been um, inputted from Tolsby Community Partnership. And um, like we say, it has been a genuine partnership approach in this. Um, just very quickly, what happens if the school during the sort of project time, the partnership flips over to academy? It doesn't really matter because the um, school ultimately still is owning the assets and the council in most cases still owns the buildings. Um, so that's not necessarily an issue for these types of projects. Um, and finally, um, I understand that public sector decarbonisation scheme relies on match funding from somewhere and whether or not, as opposed to a community group, this can be provided through any energy performance contracts to make up the difference. And it can be what, um, what it can't be provided by is the local authority loaning to the school. So there is still that gap that the school needs to find. And this seems to be a really innovative way of achieving that that involves the local community. Wow, we really are doing a whistle-stop tour of so many amazing projects. Um, Kelly, it's over to you now to do the final summing up, please, of, of your of your breakout room. <laughs> oh, great, great. I'm glad you said that. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I was with Carl from Abundance and various people from across the country, um, and we talked about how um, uh, Abundance um, local climate bonds can work uh, where councils can borrow from from abundance um, uh, via um, individual investors. Um, it can save uh, councils um, around 0.5%, which over a, a large amount of money um, that they borrow um, is can add up to quite a lot. Um, some of the benefits of it um, is that some investors um, who would invest in um, the bonds for a local council give their, their give up their returns for tree planting or rewilding projects. So that kind of adds back to the community. It demonstrates leadership and climate action for the council um, and it shows a, a positive example of how um, local people want to invest in uh, climate action in their communities. Um, we also talked about how um, councils can partner with community energy through the bonds and that is around kind of um, uh, expertise. Sometimes community energy groups uh, need some extra sort of um, uh, partnership working and people with, with skills and that's a good way that they can work together. Um, and also um, the council can use the bonds to pay local community energy groups to deliver the actual projects and, and put assets on, for example, assets solar onto roofs, um, and they can, the community energy groups can find sites that are more agile and small and can actually, you know, are based in the communities where they want to put the, the uh, uh, community energy projects. So that's how they can work. Um, Carl's got a, a nice PDF that he can share with us and he'll share that with everybody uh, via Liz. Um, so, yeah, really great session. Thank you, Carl. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your final feedback. And thank you to all of our speakers and to everybody who's still here. Uh, I, I'm... Just, was just saying to my colleague, I, I think maybe uh, this was a little bit over ambitious trying to cover so many different business models, but really the idea was to give you a little bit of a, a taster of what's out there. Um, and uh, my sense, and I'd be really interested to get your feedback on this, is that it would be good to do more um, longer sessions on some of those models that we've looked at. And um, But, you, you know, do please let me know. Yeah, and so get in touch and let me know what you'd like to hear about in the future. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I do think it was, and, and we are actually hoping to do, on the 2nd of March, we're hoping to do, a, um, a, well, we've got um, a webinar on shared prosperity funds and community bonds, so that can go into some of this stuff in more detail.